Good evening, everyone. Would you mind to stand with me? Let's do this. Why don't you step out for a moment, shake somebody's hand close to you. Maybe cross the aisle. Greet them. Tell them it's good to see them here on a midweek. You're happy they're here. It is good to see you in the house of the Lord on a Wednesday night. Let's do this as we have gathered together. Can we begin tonight's service with just a word of prayer? Can we ask the Lord to help us, to speak to us? And can we let Him know we're here tonight to worship Him? The world may be doing a lot of other things. People may be doing a lot of other things right now, but we're here tonight to worship the Lord. Can we lift our hands in the sanctuary? And just say, Lord, I'm here tonight to worship you. I give you my devotion, my mind, my time. I give you my life. I give you myself right here. Lord, I lift you up. I thank you for all that you've done. I'm careful to give you praise. Lord, and I'm in this place tonight to worship you. Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do in this house. Speak to us with your word. Lead us with your presence. Bless, deliver, restore, heal. We thank you for what you're going to do in the house. We believe you for great things in Jesus' name. Let's worship together before we hear the word tonight. God bless you. Thank you for being at Midweek. I've already heard one good report tonight that this couple right over here, John and his wife, they've already had a great week so far. So we're going to build off of that this week, huh? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for that testimony today. I'm here, I'm here to worship. I'm here, I'm here to worship. I'm here, I'm here to worship you. Aren't you here to worship? Sing. I'm here, I'm here to worship. I'm here, I'm here to worship. I'm here, I'm here to worship you. I'm here to worship. I'm here, I'm here to worship. I'm here, I'm here to worship. I'm here, I'm here to worship you. Sing it, I'm here. I'm here, I'm here to worship. I'm here, I'm here to worship. I'm here, I'm here to worship you. Sing it, ain't no rock. Ain't no rock gonna take my place. Ain't no rock gonna take my place. I'm here, I'm here to worship you. Ain't no rock, ain't no rock gonna take my place. No, ain't no rock gonna take my place. I'm here, I'm here to worship you. Go ahead, put your hands together and sing. Ain't no rock, ain't no rock gonna take my place.
thank you, Jesus. You're so glorious, Jesus. God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, dear Jesus. What a great God you are. What a great God you are, dear Jesus. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you come into this place tonight, dear Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. are lifted high, our hearts are bowing in reverence, and we're surrounded by the glory of your presence with every creature, every tongue. the broken across this place today. God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, dear Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Let's do this together. I just, I kind of felt prompted to do that. Can we pray for needs? I know that they might put some up on the screen or we, you might have a need in your life, but 
can we do this? Can we maybe link up with somebody close to you and just take a moment while we've been worshiping God? Maybe it's family to family. Maybe it's across the aisle. But let's just pray for things. I know Brother Printer Plumley needs a healing touch in his body. I know there are others that, that God needs to step in financially or provide jobs or do something. Let's just believe right now. Let's just take a moment in the middle of a midweek and pray and ask the Lord to work. Lord, thank you for what you're doing right now. Thank you for bringing peace and hope and healing. Lord, we bring needs and lives before you. God, I ask you right now that you would work on behalf of your people. Go before us, God. Heal and touch people, Lord. I pray right now you'd step into hospital rooms and living rooms and individuals' lives and their situations and surroundings. We glorify you today and believe you, God, that you're able to touch and you're able to minister. Every need, great and small, Lord, you can do it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Would you clap your hands and thank the Lord for doing it, for working tonight? I believe He's doing it. Ushers, you can go ahead and join me at the front. Thank you for, for joining us tonight. We're going to just quickly take up our offering and get into the Word here in a moment. God has been good to this church. Amen? Wave your hand at me if God's been good to you this week. I'm thankful for the testimony and the good work of the Lord. Go ahead. You can receive the offering. There's also ways to give that they'll put up on the screen. But... Uh, we will, we'll just believe God for great things. If you, don't, if, if you don't mind, let's do this. I know you've shaken hands and stepped out a little bit, but I want to encourage you to just cross over for a second. You may have done it in your comfort zone, but maybe take about two minutes and somebody that walked in and sat somewhere else, go tell them hi. Go tell them that you've had a good week or you've had an okay week. Maybe a fist bump or a hug or a handshake. But show yourself friendly tonight and greet somebody. Thank you, ushers. I appreciate it so much. God is doing great things at New Life. In Jesus' name, you can go ahead and bring your offering to front while you're standing. I'm going to show you a couple of pictures real quick as we transition and get ready to hear the word of the Lord. You can bring your offering. And if you've already brought your offering, you may be seated. I'm going to show you a couple pictures. So the picture you see on the screen as you're seated, the picture you see is a picture from Kids Camp. And I know on the Facebook family page, Sister Gaddy shared this picture and told a little bit of the story. But I want to tell you in person uh, kind of what Monday looked like at Kids Camp. So Monday, things were, it was a little wet. And things were going uh, fairly normal down there in the normal routine of how you get people checked in and everything. And it's, you know, at kids camp, from somebody that has kids, it's a little chaotic on that first day. Kids running around, you know, stomping in puddles and, and, doing, and ruining their clothes and all that. Uh, so it's a little chaotic. Well, to make matters more complicated, uh, about... 3 or 4 p.m., I think it was, and I could be wrong at the time. But about that time, the electricity on the campgrounds went out. And so it was out for four or five hours. So let me just tell you, I did, I did walk into the boys' dorm without electricity. And um, it, you know, you've heard the term, like, or you've heard in the Bible, uh, Lazarus. You know, when they said to Jesus, by now he stinketh. Well, that's really what happened there. It was rough for a little bit. So, it was not ideal, and it was not the perfect first day of camp. I'll put it that way. Well, it didn't go as planned. So, they decided, in the middle of that, they decided, we've got to do something. We've got to have some kind of event. So, they hooked up a generator... And they brought in a microphone and one little speaker amp. And they brought in glow sticks and flashlights. And you can kind of see the remnants of that. They peeled back some of the layers on the door so you can get light in. And you can see they have one microphone working. They have glow sticks and flashlights and phones. And that's the only way they're able to see inside the tabernacle. And uh, in the middle of the camp evangelist's message as he's trying to minister in the dark with one microphone the lights come back on. 
He says this. It was, it was pretty amazing. He said, God is going to do amazing things this week. Lights came on. I mean, how cool is that to experience that? And the place went wild. And if you've never heard 400 kids 12 and under scream, you're not missing anything, I promise. It was awesome. It was just awesome. It was amazing. It was not the perfect set of circumstances and how everything lined up. But let me tell you, on that night that you see that picture up on the screen, 31 children received the baptism of the Holy Ghost for the very first time time just amazing and what was what was pretty neat about that and and I've said it a couple of times as I'm kind of presenting it uh, is it wasn't perfect there wasn't this perfect set of circumstances or all these things lined up it was just the Spirit of God fell on that place on people that were willing and hungry and I thought about that uh, in lieu of of just a, a remark that I, I asked pastor if, I, if we could make and say, I know that as we move into a new building, there's a lot of things that are not perfect yet. There's a lot of things that are going to get fixed. The mic might squeal some, and that might be because my voice cracks, or it might be because the brand new sound system came out of a box, and it's got to be tuned. There could be things in the bathroom that you see, or there could be things in the parking lot, and, and I can assure you this, we have a great team here making sure this is a great facility. But at the same time, hang with us <laughs> just for a little bit. We're going to work. We're going to get it the best that we can. God has helped us come this far. And I don't know about you, but I'm excited to be in here. I'm excited for this opportunity and what the seats represent and the lives that are going to be changed here. I'm excited about this. So just we ask for your patience and understanding. We, can, we, can, we have eyes, we have ears, we see, we know. And uh, we're going to work through it all. And we're going to get there. Amen? Amen? Amen. We are going to continue a, our series we've been doing. This is week nine of studying the book of 1 Corinthians. Can you believe that? Week number nine. So grab your Bible. And we are going to look at the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number eight. We've been talking, there's a phrase that you may have seen if you've been reading along or you've heard different teachers come up and teach on it. It's inherit the kingdom. And basically with our theme in 2021 of kingdom come, what we want to do is walk in the daily principles of inheriting the kingdom of God in our life. So what does that look like? And one of the, one of a great letter in the Bible that instructs us on how to inherit the kingdom and what we ought to do is the book of 1 Corinthians. It gives us a lot of practical and helpful things that we can flesh out and walk out in our life. Um, it, it appears that as this book was written, and you've heard many different, you've, well, you've heard a, many different people come and speak and tell different backdrops. It appears that in this book, there were questions that the Corinthian church had about certain things and Paul addresses the questions. Now, how many of you in this room would be honest and say, you've come to church, you've heard something, and you had a question about it? Raise your hand. Now, also be honest and say, you've had a question about it, and maybe at a later date or in a service, a preacher was preaching, a teacher was teaching, and your question got answered by the Word of God. Raise your hand. So that is a powerful thing, to have the Word of God come alive in your life and teach you. And Paul does this in the book of 1 Corinthians. He uses the Word of God, and he helps instruct the people of Corinthians in their questions that they had about how to live and what they ought to do. So tonight, we're going to talk about 1 Corinthians chapter number 8. Now, I want you to look at your neighbor. We're going to, I'm going to tell you the topic on hand for these two chapters we're going to talk about tonight. Look at your neighbor and say, Christian Liberties. Christian liberties. So, we learned in the very first lesson of this series, we learned that the Corinthians had many temples to other gods. They had all throughout their city, they had temples that would worship other gods, and this was a problem. So many things inside of it were a problem for the Corinthian church, because what was happening in the, these temples to other gods 
What was happening there was infiltrating into the church. It was coming into their mindset, their worship, their activities. The world was creeping into the church. Now, I know we can all be honest and say that still happens today to a degree. It sure does. It happens. The church rises up, pushes back against it, but the, the world tries its best to tear down the only hope that people have, and that's the church. So the world wants to tear it down. And so even in that day, even in the study that we're doing, it was trying to remove and tear down some things and infiltrate with different teachings and doctrines and lifestyles and habits. But the Corinthian temples, they were also... Now, this is going to sound very odd for us in our current climate, but this is what happened. For them, inside of their temples, they were also used as butcher shops. So that sounds odd, right? Can you imagine Sister Gaddy out there cutting up a cow? Serving it up to people as they came through. They were used as butcher shops. They also, they would house these dining establishments where business transactions and other social engagements would happen. So the locals, they offered, they would come and they would offer their meat and incense sacrifices to the icons and the traditional gods quote unquote, of the day. They would offer them to gods like, that you've probably heard these names, Apollos, Athena, Zeus. They felt like those were, th those were gods that they could bring a sacrifice and an offering to. So they would, they would bring these meat offerings to it. A meat was offered and then turned around and cooked and purchased. And, and during a festival, any festival that would take place, the city would be flooded with people coming in to bring these meat sacrifices in order to give them to these other gods and sell them and make a little money also. And that's how the temple was used. Well, now, that's kind of a historical example. Here's the problem for the church, and then we're going to get into what is said in the Word of God. Here's the problem. There were people in the congregation of the Corinthians that came out of that lifestyle and belief system. They had, they had once been wrapped up in it. They had once believed that was real. They had once brought meat offerings and sacrifices. They had done that before. And so for them, this was very unique. They had come out of that lifestyle to a completely different lifestyle. There are people today in this church, you came out of a lifestyle into a drastically different lifestyle here of the church, of the word of God and the things of God, you came out of that into here and things are very much different than they were for you before. So these, in, these individuals came out and, and this, is, this is Paul's word, so don't think that I'm labeling him or saying this, but if these weak, quote unquote, if these weak members happen to walk up to the temple market and see a respected member of the church taking and eating some of the meat that was for display, well, that was hard for them to process. That was hard for them to, to, to justify because for them, maybe they thought, hold on a second, wait a second, if, if they can do it, then it's okay for me to do it. I, I can, then I can partake in this. And the, the danger with that is for somebody that came out of that lifestyle, out of those decisions, the danger with that is they could easily fall back into it just by witnessing a, a distinguished, established member of the church partaking in something. So, the question comes, 1 Corinthians 8, verse number 1. Now, concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. But knowledge puffs up and love edifies. See, this is why I... I but charity also is, is the King James word for love. Here's what I love about Paul. So Paul doesn't just say, okay, let's talk about food right now. Let's talk about food. Let me just give you the golden rule on it. He doesn't do that. He says this, and I think this is so wise and so helpful, especially today. Let me give you a principle to live by. Okay, I can give you a rule and tell you, don't ever do this, don't ever cross this, don't ever go there, don't ever act that way. I could give you just a, a blanket statement, or I could give you a principle from the Word of God 
that can greatly grow you and help you, not just in this area, but in all areas that you deal with. I can help you. I can, I can give you this answer. So can we eat meat related to the purchase meat from the temple market? What if it's served this way? What if this happens? What if that? And so he says this in the, in the verse. Look, look at how, the screen, how it lays out. Knowledge puffeth up, but love, but love or charity edifieth. Now, I want to make this disclaimer right here. Knowledge and love or charity are not opposites. They're not. In this context, knowledge is not a good thing. Knowledge is some arrogance or belief that you know and are better or you have something greater or better than somebody else. So Paul is referencing here, we know that we all have knowledge. All of us have knowledge. We all have an understanding. But listen, your arrogance inside of that knowledge or with that knowledge is not a good thing. It puffs up. But love, on the other hand, love edifies. While, and, and this is how I would say it. While knowledge puffs up, love builds up. That's how I would, that's, that's how I think he's, he's, what he's saying, and that, that's, that's my words, but knowledge, it will puff up. Have you ever had anything swell up before on you? It, it's, it's not overly healthy. Okay, I'm going to tell a story before the Christmas angel tells it. Okay, so I can just, I can just get my, my error out of my ways. I'm going to tell it right now. It happened today. Okay? And, and it, it goes along with this. To a degree, but I did want to tell it before it got out bad on me. Um, or the cameras, if there's video footage of it. So I was walking in the Life Center, and here's the thing, okay? When they tell you to don't text and drive, it's a really good rule. Don't walk and text either. That's also a really good rule. So I was walking in the Life Center, I was walking down the hallway. I don't think there's a camera. Somebody's frantically going to go look. I understand right now. I was walking in the Life Center, and I was texting somebody. I was looking down at my phone, and the double doors right beside the ladies' bathroom, they were, one of them was open, and one of them was closed. And I thought they were both open. So as I'm looking down, staring at my phone, I walked headfirst right into that door. That, no, 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 and, and hold on a second. I want you to feel bad for me. The corner of the door... And, and I know nobody feels bad. If you could see my hand right now, I don't know if you could see that. It just, I thought I broke my hand. I hit it, I dropped the phone, and I'm, I, I immediately, I immediately text Ashley, oh God, I've got to go to the ER, my hand is broke. You know how you are, I'm a big baby. And I, I, I did, it was all purple, I sent a picture to Ashley of it, it was all swollen up. Now it looks fine, it looks a little normal, it's a little scraped. But thank you for praying for me. I appreciate it. It swelled up on me. And sometimes in arrogance, what we think we know or how much we think we know or how much better we may think we are than somebody else, which is not true, but that can swell us up or puff us up a little bit. The reality is our mindset cannot be on what we know, but it has to be about how we love people. And to me, that is the definition of how we deal with Christian liberties. Christian liberties are basically this. If I, had to, if I had to sum up how Christian liberties, I know it's a theological term, but Christian liberties is this. How do we navigate the gray areas of our life for ourselves and others? And to me, at the very first verse, he gives the answer to that. Look, knowledge will puff you up. In your arrogance, if you believe it's, you're better, it will puff you up. But in love, you have the ability to build others up. Verse 2, and if anyone, because Paul doesn't stop there, if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. He's attacking those people that think they're arrogant. Look, you think you know a lot. The truth is you don't. The reality is you don't know all the things that there is to know. But if anyone loves God, verse 3, this one is known by him. What appears to be happening is that the knowledge of God was inflating the minds of the Corinthian converts. So, Paul's going to deal with it. Verse number four, look at verse number four with me. 
Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols. Now watch, because Paul is witty, and I think he uses word choices on purpose. We know that an idol is nothing, and, there, and that there is no other God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, and I'll stop, I'll stop right here as we're, as we're reading this verse. There are a lot of things in this world that consider themselves to be a god. There are a lot of things vying for your attention that you can make a god in your life. But let's just be real for a second. They're not god. They don't have the, that power. They're not equivalent to him. They're not a rival unless you make him. They're not a rival. They can't compete with him. He alone is God. So there is, so, so this idea that there are other people, there's a, termino, there's a terminology in modern, in, in modern context and speech, and, and, and some of the youth say this thing, this guy's godlike, and they'll say that. And if, if you want my opinion, that's extremely offensive and wrong because nobody is like God. There's no one like him. I don't care what your human ability allows you to do. Nothing, nobody is like the Lord. There is, for us, we know there is only one God. And these other things may label themselves that way. They may declare that. They may say there's no other God that heals. There's no other God that saves. There's no other God that works like he works, when he works, how he works. There is no other God. And Paul is emphatically saying this. Look, there is no other God. Verse 6, yet for us there is one God, the Father of whom are all things, for, we, for him and for one Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we live. Verse number 7, however, there is not everyone with that knowledge. For some, with consciousness of the idol. Now remember, you remember how I opened and told you that there were people that had come out of that lifestyle of, of offering meat and, and things to idols. There were those that came out of that. So here's our Paul addresses it. For some, with consciousness of the idol, until now, eat it as a thing offered to an idol. And their conscience, being weak, is defiled. So, and I think there's a little bit of an undertone here of what Paul's saying. I think there's a little bit of an undertone that allowing idols to have a, an amount of power in your life or, or, or belief or trust in God is a little bit of a weak or lesser mindset. We can't let idols work their way in and become like God because there's no thing like God. Nothing compares to him. Verse number eight. Now, this is where he deals with it. You remember I said at the beginning, it's better that he gives you the principle. Well, he's just going to plainly say it here. But food does not commend us to God. For neither if we eat it are we better, nor if we do not eat it are we worse. So the food is not the issue. Okay? And, and how many of you know, most of the time, you've learned this in your life, the issue is really not the issue. Anybody learn that? The issue most of the time is really not the issue. There's something deeper at play. So here is the issue, and I believe I highlighted this verse in my Bible. Verse number nine. But beware, and I'm going to read this from the screen. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to them that are weak. Because knowledge says, oh, I'm, I know better, I am better, I figured this out. But love says, I don't want to do this if it hurts you. I don't want to step there or go there or say that or act this way if it impacts you. To me, and I'll just say it this way, I believe that is a very Christian mature way to live. Now, I'm not encouraging us to fall in the ditch of people-pleasing, and I'm not encouraging us to live in, the, in the, the realm or the world where we don't do anything because we're afraid to offend somebody. I'm not encouraging that we fall on either side of the road on that. But the reality is, all of us have to live in a state, we must live in a state, even right now, in a state where we love each other to build each other up. Not 
participate in questionable activities that just might pull somebody down. Now, that's a hard statement to make. And that's a hard thing to flesh out. But if my liberty and freedom becomes a stumbling block to somebody else, then it's really not a freedom. It's really not even a choice, to be honest with you. Got to guard myself and be others minded. Now, I do, we, have this, uh, we have this principle in our home, and I got it from somebody else, so it's not original with us, but it's something that we do in our house. And I thought about it in this particular moment to share it here. We have, this, uh, we have this thing that we always tell our boys, uh, and I hope they do a good job of this, but we, we always try to, to teach it and get practical examples and walk in it, and it's this, be others-minded. That's what we tell them all the time. Be others-minded, okay? If you're selfish, like for instance, um, Judah, and I'm gonna, he doesn't do this, but I'm using him as an example, and I owe him a dollar since I preached about him. Judah, that's true, he, if he ever sees this, don't tell him. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Judah, if he walked down the supermarket, if, he, if, if we're at Walmart or Kroger or whatever, we're walking down the aisle, and Judah decides that there's this can of, or this bottle drink or whatever, Judah decides that in his six-year-old body, he's got to have something to hit with the baseball bat, and this is his baseball bat, and he takes it and knocks it over. Judah decides to do that. Well, what we tell them in that is, well, hold on, bud. Somebody might be behind us that beca- that's coming for that exact auto. And so while you thought that was fun and that was funny, at the same time, that person that's coming down the aisle, they, this is, makes it more difficult than to find what they were looking for. So in this, be considerate of how what your actions are doing to somebody else. Be others-minded. Now, I think, I believe personally, that is a great way in living for God to view many things that may fall in a gray area. If how I live negatively impacts them, I'm going to be others-minded with them. I'm going to be mindful of their heart and their past and their life and who they are. I've got to do a better job of that, of being mindful of where do people come from? What, what have they been a part of? And if something that I feel free to do negatively tears down and they stumble with it, well, then I'm going to guard and watch my behavior because I don't want to be a stumbling block for anybody. Now, let me show you, as Paul reads through this, let me show you some of the things that Paul writes that are so good for this. Verse number 10, 1 Corinthians 8. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge and eating of the idol's temples, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? So they're going to participate just like they saw you. And because of your knowledge shall your weak brother perish. Now watch this. Watch these words. Go to verse number, I think it's number 11. And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish. Now look at the next four words on that screen. Now I can tell you this to me, these are four words that can revolutionize how you see people. Jesus died for them. And that can drastically change some behaviors and thoughts that you do because you realize that person is somebody that Jesus Christ died for. And they may be wrong and living in sin. They may have done me wrong and sinned against me. But that person right there, Jesus Christ died for them. And that changes my perception of them for the better. And I want to make sure that, that as, a, as a believer, not just to non-believers, but believers in the church, I want to make sure that my attitude, rem, that I remember that that person, as much as I want to do my own thing, Jesus died for them just like he died for me. It's important to keep that in the context. Verse number 12. But when you thus sin, and he, he'll just, Paul will just say it plainly, but when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, read those next words, you sin against Christ. So, Paul's Paul's saying this. I'm not just telling you that this is a good idea, but when you go wound somebody else because of your own liberty and freedom, that's actually a sin against you. That actually falls, the blame falls on you for taking it that far and doing that action. Therefore, verse number 13, if food, I love this, because I just think it gives a great 
understanding, verse number 13, I think it gives a great understanding of Paul's mentality. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat again, lest I make my brother stumble. Now that's a, just a huge statement to make. It is a big thing to say, but as a Christian, we cannot carry the mantra of, well, I only answer to God and God alone. Galatians says this, we've got to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So I don't want to be the one that drags and tears my own brother or sister down. And to inherit the kingdom, I put this in my notes because I felt like it was needed to be said. To inherit the kingdom of God is to have a value of where others are spiritually. Not condemnation and not being condescending towards somebody, but value where they are. And look at each other, look at, look at all of us, look at it and say, I value where your walk with God is right now. And I may have had a different experience and things may have been revealed to me in a different manner and God may be leading me a different, different place at this moment. But I value where you are enough that my behaviors and stuff are going to be modified. My words are going to be modified because I value you. I see you. I'm not just focusing on me and my knowledge and understanding, but I look here and I want a love that builds others up. Let's turn the page and go to the, the chapter number nine because this whole thing continues. It actually continues past chapter number nine, but here's what I'm going to do too. I'm gonna, we're kind of at the halfway point because we finished one chapter. We're going we're gonna to begin to talk about the next chapter. Uh, this is what I did on this one. Now, every morning when I read my Bible, I, and this is just how I am, and I know I'll get some amens and some, some look at me sideways. I prefer the King James Version. I just do. That's my personal preference. And I, I, there's a lot of depth in the words there, so that's my personal preference. For the next few minutes, I read chapter number nine in the King James Version and struggled to read a little bit. And I felt confident that in order to greatly understand the context and everything that he's saying, I wanted to change translations just to something that would be able, that we could read on the screen together. It doesn't change the significant meaning of anything. Please don't think we're going off in the false doctrine or believing and teaching things that are not true. That's not right. I'm just showing you a different translation to help us grasp how this chapter lays out because I think it's very well worded in this translation. The New Living Translation, 1 Corinthians 9, and if BJ, if you don't mind to help me with the New Living Translation, 1 Corinthians 9 says this, Am I, Paul talking, can, and now it feels like he's changing subjects, but he's not. He's going to come back around to it. Am I not as free as anyone else? So th this, is, this is interesting. The, the Corinthians, they had this slogan or this mantra that they would use, and it was all about the word freedom. We're free to do what we want to do. If you've been in this study, you've learned the Corinthians thought, well, we're free to choose who we follow. We can be of Apollos, or we could be of Paul, or we could be of Christ. We have freedom to choose. If you heard Pastor Larry teach in this pulpit last week, he, there were some things that they thought they were free to operate, to, to have indulge in sexual immorality. They felt like they were free to go down that road. And they felt they were free to eat certain meats. They felt like they had this certain freedom. And so Paul, like he is, comes up and says this, am I not as free as anybody else? You're over here boasting about your freedom, but let me tell you for a second. I'm just as free as anybody else that you can think of. Am I not as free as anyone? Am I not an apostle? Haven't I seen Jesus our Lord with my own eyes? Isn't it because of my work that you belong to the Lord? And he says this in verse number three. This is my answer to those who question my authority. Don't we have the right, verse 4, to live in your homes and share your meals? Don't we have the right to bring a believing wife with us as other apostles and the Lord's brothers do, and as Peter does? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have to work and support ourselves? It's like the Corinthians in their freedom, quote unquote, air marks here, 
It's like the, the Corinthians in their freedom thought that they had the right to refuse Paul and refuse to support him and Barnabas because they weren't real apostles. Now, I don't have the guts to look Apostle Paul in the face and say, you're not a real apostle. I don't, but they did. And he's saying to them, didn't, didn't I do this? Aren't you in the church because of me? Didn't I help start this? Aren't you here because of my work? Am I not as free as anybody else is? Verse number seven. So he gives some analogies to help clarify this. He gives some, some things, and he'll even quote Old Testament scripture in this passage I'm going to read. What soldier has to pay for his own expenses? What farmer plants a vineyard and doesn't have the right to eat some of its fruit? What shepherd cares for a flock of sheep and isn't allowed to drink some of the milk? Am I expressing just a, a human point of view, or doesn't the law say the same thing? For the law of Moses says, you must not muzzle an ox to keep it from eating as it treads out the grain. Now, was God thinking only about an oxen when he said this? Wasn't he actually talking to us? Now, I read, I read a commentary on that because he's quoting from, it goes back to Deuteronomy 25. I read, a, I read a commentary on that today that I, I, actually, I actually laughed at when I said, uh, when, I, when I read this, it came across this. So this is a quote from Deuteronomy 25 and 4 about supplying for the people that spiritually supply for you or lead you. And, and this is what the, the quote said. Since oxen cannot read, this verse was not written for them. It's for us. Yes, it was written for us. Verse number 10. Yes, it was written for us. So that the only one who plows and the only one who threshes the grain might both expect a share of the harvest. God is establishing a principle that a minister has the right to be supported by the people he ministers to. Paul teaches it back in the Old Testament and he teaches it here. Or it's taught in the Old Testament and Paul's teaching it here. Verse number 11. Since we have planted spiritual seed among you, aren't we entitled to harvest of physical food and drink? If you support others who preach to you, shouldn't we have an even greater right to be supported? But we have never used this right. Now, you're wondering how all this comes where Christian liberty and then the right to support ministers and oxen and all this, how it ties together. This verse kind of bridges that gap. We would rather put up with anything, the end of verse number 12, we would rather put up with anything than be an obstacle to the good news about Christ. So he's saying, I would rather do anything that it takes so that somebody could be saved. No matter what that is to me, my mission is not my personal comfort. My mission is his mission. My mission is to save the lost and to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I think all of us ask the question at some point, Lord, is what I'm doing standing in the way of somebody hearing the gospel? And if we answer that honestly in something that we are doing, then we've got to change so that the gospel can continue to go. Paul was a tent maker for his job. That's what he did for a living. So Paul wouldn't take income from some of these churches and wouldn't, we wouldn't receive some. He did some, but he didn't, wouldn't receive some because he was a tent maker, because he was willing to do whatever it took for the gospel to reach certain people. And that job that he did is important as we begin to read some of this and go on in verse chapter number nine. Verse number 13, look at me, or you can look on the screen because you may not have the New Living Translation in front of you. Verse number 13. Don't you realize that those who work in the temple get their meals from the offerings that are brought in the temple? And those who serve at the altar get a share of sacrificial offerings. In the same way, the Lord ordered that those who preach the good news should be supported by those who benefit from it. 15. Yet I have never used any of these rights, and I am not writing to suggest that I want to start right now. In fact, I would rather die than lose my right to boast about preaching without charge. That's how serious he is with it. 
Verse 16, yet preaching the good news is not something I can boast about because I am compelled by God to do it. And how terrible for me it would be if I did not preach the good news. The King James says this, woe to me if I preach not. Because that's, that's just my mission in life, is to share the, the gospel. And that's, I'll say this right here, that's got to be our mission. That's got to be who we are. That the, the, the gospel is shared through us, and that's the reason we are in this community, in this church, on our jobs, wherever we are. That the mission flows through us. Verse 17, if I were doing this on my own initiative, I would deserve payment. But I have no choice, for God has given me the sacred trust. What then is my pay? It is the opportunity to preach the good news without charging anyone. That's why I never demand my rights when I preach the gospel. Listen, he's attacking the very heart of these people's idea of they have the freedom and right to do what they want to do. He's coming right down their street, right into their face, and he's saying, I, this is how I live and this is how I approach this. Because I'm not, I don't operate by my own rights and my own freedom. I preach the gospel, and that is where my freedom lies. That's where my purpose is. And I think you see Paul's real heart. Paid or not paid, it did not matter to him. What mattered was the work of the gospel. And if it was more effective for him to receive support, he would receive it. If it was more effective for him not to receive it, he would do that. Whatever it took for the gospel to be shared. That's Paul's mentality. Verse number 19. And we're going to get into some of more of his mentality in a second. Verse number 19. And I wanted to read this whole chapter in it because I think it lays a great groundwork and tells a lot of great truths. Even though I am free with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. So then he, he launches into, and many of you have probably heard this portion or passage for Scripture. If you've been around church for a number of years, you've probably heard this reference sometime. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew. To, to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who followed the Jewish law, I too lived under the Jewish law. Even though I am not subject to the law. I did this so that I could bring them to Christ. Verse 221. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from the law so that I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. When I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness. For I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. Now, many people read that, that whole passage that I read, and they think Paul lowered his standards to live differently for different people. I don't believe that's the case at all. Paul's not lessening his own convictions or lessening his stance. Paul is so passionate about people and loving people that he's willing to get out of where he's comfortable with and out of what he's doing to say, I, I may have to change some things about me or how I feel about stuff, but that doesn't matter because I'm focused on you. Because I want to see you come to this. So if that means that I'm going to go do this, that's fine. I'm going to bring you to Christ. He never lost the mission, ever, at any point. It was always a part of him. Now, he took this to extremes, okay? He was so willing to share the gospel with people that he took it to extremes. And let me prove it to you. Acts 21, verses 23 through 26, Paul participated in Jewish purification ceremonies which were not necessary for him, but he hoped it would build some type of bridge to somebody. So he participated in it just so he could win somebody and bring them over. I talk about getting out of your own comfort zone or getting out of where you stand. He was willing to say, okay, this may not be how I am, 
But if this leads somebody to Jesus Christ, I'm going to do it. I'm going to be willing to do it. As well as Acts 16. Now this is a kicker, okay? Paul had Timothy circumcised. Again, not because it was necessary, but because it was helpful in getting ministry to somebody. He was willing to say, look, we've got to do what we can to get the gospel out to people. I'm so thankful for the ministries of this church. But how many of you got to, how many of you viewed the small group video a few weeks ago, a couple weeks back, the small group's video, and you heard Brother Jordan's story about the side door? How many of y'all remember that? What a powerful illustration. He said, you know, you have the front door and hopefully you close the back door to the church. But he said that, that this lady was saved from being kidnapped because she went in the side door of a convenience store. And Brother Jordan's point in that lesson was this, how many side doors are the, is the church opening so that we can get people in? What kind of opportunities are we presenting to people to bring them in? And I, I, when I read this passage, I so thought of Brother Jordan and that analogy and that, that story. What can we do to bridge the gap to somebody on our street, on our job, in our family that shares the gospel with them. Not lowering our standards, but reaching for them. I've heard the analogy said from many different preachers, you hold on to truth, but you reach and pull people out of hell. And I believe wholeheartedly that's what we've got to be doing in this hour. And that's Paul's mentality. Whatever it takes, we are committed to the gospel. Now, I'm going to finish this chapter, and then the, the last thing that I'm going to do before we, we turn you loose, the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to read a whole passage from Romans that I think really outlines Christian liberties. I'm going to read that here in a moment. But let's finish this chapter and see how Paul finishes this off. Verse number 24, you can read it on the screen. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete training to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that my preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. In the King James Version, it says this, a corruptible crown is what these people were trying and reaching for. Ironically, sexual intercourse that we covered over the last few weeks, immorality, and eating meats at this time, ironically, in, in the Corinthians, that time era, they were considered by athletes to be a weakening or a lesser lifestyle if you participated in those type of things. So, an athlete would discipline themselves to give themselves the best chance of winning by abstaining from a few things. And, and, and the irony that Paul is bringing out here, do you have the picture of it looks like almost like a wreath? Back in, in these times, they would put up, and, and if you don't, it's okay. Back in these times, when you would win at a race or an athletic competition, they would put this type, of item on your head to crown you as the winner of this competition, the race, whatever it was, they would put this type of thing on top of your head. Now, this is a, a, a rough picture of what many thought it looked like, but if you go and look and do some research on it, what they would use is parts of celery to build this wreath they would place on people's head. Now, is there anybody in the room that likes celery? Oh, wow. I was surprised by that. I used to not, but I, I, I kind of enjoy it now that I'm getting old. I like it. They used to build these out of celery. Now, how many of you know, if you were to go home right now and you had celery in your fridge, you pulled it out and you left it on the counter for 24 hours, what would happen to it? It would wilt. It would turn brown and mushy. And these individuals would compete for a crown of celery. And they would put that non-lasting, weak, flimsy thing on top of their head and feel great accomplishment. And 24 hours later, you wouldn't want to be around that thing because of the smell and the mush that it is. 
you wouldn't want it. And Paul, in this, is saying these athletes and these people are disciplining themselves for that. How much more should a Christian discipline their own lifestyle so that others could be brought into the church? How much more should somebody deny of themselves some things and make sure that they're, they're, they're abstaining from some things and they, they have some ways that they should... How much more should they do that for a crown that will never fade away? For an eternity that will always be there? How much more should we pull ourselves? Listen, I don't want my freedom to corrupt the mission of the church. I don't want it. I want the mission to remain and be a part of who we are, that we might save some. Romans 14, I'm going to read in the New Living Translation again, and I like how it says, and this is how we'll close tonight, but I like how this words it and says it, and it talks about the same, same subject of Christian liberties. Accept those believers, verse number one, who are weak in faith, and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. For instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything, but another believer with a sensitive conscience will only eat vegetables. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them. Who are you to condemn someone else's servants? What a statement. Who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Their own master will judge them whether they stand or fall, and with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. In the same way, some think that one day is more holy than another, while others think every day is alike. You should each be fully convinced that whichever day that you choose is acceptable. Those who worship the Lord on a special day do it to honor him, and those who eat any kind of food do so to honor the Lord, since... They give thanks to God before eating. And those who refuse to eat certain foods also do what? To please the Lord and give thanks to Him. For we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. If we live, listen, it's to honor the Lord. And if we die, it's to honor the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Christ died and rose again for this very purpose to be both Lord and the living and the dead. Jump down to verse number 14. And I know I'm convinced by the authority of the Lord Jesus that no food in and of itself is wrong to eat, but if someone believes it's wrong, then for that person it is wrong. And if another believer is distressed by what you eat, you are not acting in love if you eat it. Don't let your eating ruin someone for whom Christ died then you will not be criticized for doing something you believe is good. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. If you serve Christ with this attitude, you will please God, and others will approve of you too. So then, let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. I'm going to read chapter 15, 1 through 3, and this will be the conclusion. Who are we, we who are strong must be considerate of those who are sensitive about things like this. Now, this was the part that I, I thought was so clear. We must not just please ourselves. We should help others do what is right to build them up, for even Christ didn't live to please himself. Would you stand with me? The principle of Christian liberties is very simple. I'm not here to please me. Even Jesus didn't do that. But I am here so that I could either lead someone to Christ or build someone else up. Before we leave tonight, can we lift our hands and ask this word to come into our heart? Whatever he spoke on whatever level for you, ask to receive it right now. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for clarity in your word. Thank you so much for conviction in your word. Thank you, God, for speaking and directing us 
on how we ought to live and what we ought to do. God, I pray that you would help us to abstain from some things if it leads somebody to discover the truth of your gospel. Help us, Lord, to stand firm in the truth but reach for others because they need the truth of this. Lord, I pray that you would help us, show us, lead us to be others-minded. God, to consider what we do and how it impacts other people. Let us walk in truth and grace and mercy. Help us walk in love. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. Thank you for being at Midweek this week. I hope you enjoyed the word tonight. And God bless you. We'll see you Sunday at 1030 for a great service. You are dismissed in Jesus' name. God bless you.